Are we here? We're here. I'm here. Uh, You're there, are, but we're here. Are you no, here? Are you with us right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back to episode 14 of the Ramblin' Fly podcast. Can't believe we've been doing 14 of these now. We're but, still numbering them, huh? Yeah, still numbering. <laughs> um, this one is all about fly tying. Uh, we got a lot of requests to... Uh, do a fly tying podcast. I personally receive a lot of questions on emails and Instagram about fly tying. And so when I was talking to Brent about that, Brent was like, Oh, we got to do just a whole fly tying episode here. So, um, guys, if you are listening to this on, uh, Google or Apple or wherever, Spotify, wherever you're at, um, we are going to be showing some visual cues today, uh, which you can hop on over to our YouTube channel. If you want to see some of the stuff, we're going to be talking about some fly tying tools. And uh, those will be in the YouTube that you can see on the Ramblin' Fly podcast YouTube channel. But, Britt, let's, uh, let's start off getting into the, uh, the runoff this week. What, what have you been up to? Because last, last week you had a pretty big announcement for us. Last week was the big announcement. As you can see, I am double decker branded today. So uh just fully moving into the new brands. No, we uh well, Adam, I think since we recorded that, you and I went to Alabama or excuse me, Louisiana. We did and did a little red fishing. A I little bit. that was one of the tougher trips I've had. I mean Ooh, it was a bad trip, if I'm mm-hmm. honest. It was not it, my expectations of Redfish, Louisiana. Yeah, well, for those of you that haven't been down there, the Louisiana redfish are generally willing to play ball, and they're they'll make you feel pretty good about yourself sometimes. And yeah. this trip wasn't that. Uh, they didn't do we, that. We struggled me. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that uh, there'll be at least a podcast coming from that. Hopefully, we can scrounge up enough footage to make a a video, but. We got a those, couple of those sets, a co- some some good fish footage, hopefully. So, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, yep. definitely stay tuned for that. Definitely, man. Other than that, I've been driving around trying to meet all the all the new shops, uh, kind of get the changeover going on with with the existing shops, and had some really good conversations. Uh, man, I'm I'm really excited to have like the full breadth of product, as well as be just in the fly world and. You know, yeah, I can't imagine how big, how much more difficult the old job was with you having to do all the hunting stuff, all sorts of crazy different brands, and then also fly fishing stuff. Like, that's a that's crazy. This one seems a little more meaningful in the fly fishing world just because the breadth of product is higher, sure. But you know, across across the board, yeah, the other job was definitely more difficult trying to bounce between hunting and fishing and guns and ammo and back into nerdy fly fishing, which is. Yeah, yeah. I get that. What about the fishing reports trout wise? Have you heard anything about that? I've been in, I've been in Louisiana for a month. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't caught a trout since our last film. Yeah. Got to get back out there. I haven't been freshwater fishing since our last film period. So I I have no idea. Yeah. What happened to streamer season? I mean, we're almost through that if we're not already through it. You could argue that redfish is a stre- is a streamer fish. That's a good. I would rather argue that. We did get hit with a uh, crazy cold front. It went from like eighty degrees, sunny, and wearing short sleeves and shorts, to like thirty degrees in under twenty four hours, and uh, it really messed my sinuses up. <laughs> yeah, dude, this winter just like. There was no it, season. It was yeah, it just happened. To, it was like a yeah. light switch. I feel like we say that every year, but then every year it feels worse than the year before. <laughs> Maybe. We're just soft from our summer skin. That must be it. Yeah. I'm soft. I'm just soft. Just Well, I, have I refuse excuse. to admit that. I'm not open to that criticism. <laughs> I'm not open to that. <laughs> well, guys, we're going to get into it. Our fly tying stuff. So to start off, We had everyone uh, who follows us on Instagram, we asked for some comments on what fly tying myths do you want us to kind of talk about? So Brent has got a really good list of myths 
uh, submitted by you guys that we want to kind of go through and answer some questions. Um, but the number one question that we get asked either, you know, me personally or on, on our, like our Instagram or emails is how do I start fly tying? We kind of wanted to, to do like a myths thing to kind of help bust and maybe break down some of those, uh, barriers for you guys to start and then give both mine and Brent's opinion. Uh, and we have not talked about how, our opinions here at all. So I have no idea how different or how similar these are going to be. But Brent and I have both worked in fly shops, which sold fly tying gear. And uh, so we're going to tell you guys how we broke it down when we were working in shops. And then uh, kind of my how to get into it and Brent's how to get into it. Um, and then we're going to run through just a list of tools and the, the must-have things uh, to get started. So. Hopefully that sounds good to you. If it does, keep listening and watching because that's essentially what we're going to do for the next 30 minutes or <laughs> however long this takes. <laughs> Who knows how long we'll go for. Who knows? No. Um, I do have a date with Chipotle here as soon as we finish this, so, though. So. Ooh. Where'd you meet her? Uh, just downtown, right over here. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> um, Brent, <laughs> I... why don't you tell the tell the nice listening folks What's your what's your fly tying resume look like? Because I actually have no idea what your fly tying resume is. Well, you've never seen me tie a fly. If you could submit a bibliography to myself and the people, that would be great. That would be awesome. Well, let's get into it. I never tied flies until I worked at the shop. And then I started tying a little bit enough to learn the basics, really. And... I've got big hands and I'm quite impatient. So tying nymphs was the, the big hands is not an excuse for tying nymphs. I'll put that out there, but I know what they say about fly tires with big hands. Only streamers can't tie nymphs. (laughs) No, I, I just get impatient and the fly bins were right there. So I didn't want to tie nymphs, but there were things I wanted out of streamers that it wasn't as easy to get. So I would tie streamers and I did that for a while, but I don't know, there's companies making great streamers now. So kind of faded off of that. I, the one thing I really enjoyed doing was tying redfish flies because you could get a little wild with them. And yeah, so, so basically I tied redfish flies and I would say the, the pinnacle of my resume, like the number one bullet point, bold highlighted, I, uh, I, developed and i'm sure this has never been done before no one's ever thought of this before Probably but uh not. no no there's no chance i developed a pop and cork fly and it involved a uh, a triple rattle system so i had three rattles a giant chunk of foam and um the whole point of that was just to hang like a shrimp or a crab fly off the bottom of it and it didn't work because <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a sight to see and the triple rattle system was just revolutionary but yeah that's it has to be it's got to be that's it no i've uh i've dabbled in fly tying i you know have have hung around quite a few fly tying nights where much much better tires than me are are tying and i'll pick their brain about it but as far as uh my interest in time i don't spend a lot of time doing it straight up there you are there There you you have it well i would definitely say from where i'm sitting is uh the best thing to do is not to tie flies the best thing to do is become friends with someone who ties flies bingo (laughs) so uh you did it right uh yeah because I'm the one who's always, oh, Adam, what flies? Did, did, yeah, did yeah. You, what, what all did you bring me today? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it works like, great. Well, yeah. And then you just get handed a whole bag of flies to pick from. So. Yeah. <laughs> a bag. But, yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, so uh, since Brent and I both worked in fly shops, Brent, I'd love to hear, like, if someone walked into the fly shop while you were working there and you were just on the floor or whatever, and they walked in and said, you know what, I kind of want to get into fly tying. How would you start them out? Uh, Maybe the 
folks listening don't have a local fly shop to walk into and say that, or, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they just are kind of trying to figure this out on their own. How would you go about telling a new customer, or not a new, maybe not a new customer, but a customer who's new to fly tying, where would you start them out? I, I always started out with the, how confident are you that you're going to really like fly tying? And like, how, how much do you think you're actually going to want to do this? Because I do think there are some advantages to some of the nicer vices, and that's probably your your biggest singular purchase to begin with. But um, that's what I start out with. How long are you going to plan on doing this? And if they said, I'm pretty convinced I'm going to be into this, then I'd probably point out a rotary vice and maybe maybe something with a little more comfort features on it. But honestly, I'd ask them what they'd want to tie. I'd look up a couple recipes and get the get the basics if it's a pattern that I didn't know which most of them are so <laughs> uh, one thing I had going for me was I I did spend time to memorize where all the where all the stuff on the shelves were and and uh had a system to to look up recipes and and get it going on if if no one that was in the shop that was actually a real fly tire what about you where did you start uh definitely like you said I would go like okay you know analyze budget first like or, or is this something you're willing to get into you want to get into it like just like everything of course even just like starting out with fly fishing again it's a whole new it's almost like a whole new hobby i would definitely gauge budget like how much money do you want to put into this and i mean it's almost like starting an entire new hobby just like just like starting fly fishing again fly tying is almost like a whole new thing it's a whole new set of tools it's a whole new you know uh, set of information that you have to learn. And, uh, I probably like you gauge, like, okay, d- is this person like a really big fly fisherman? Like, because you certainly wouldn't want to, you know, get them all set up with everything fly tying wise, if they're maybe not even sure on st- sticking with fly fishing. Um, so that's definitely kind of where I would go from the, the best thing for me about fly tying is that you can kind of break it out over, you know, if you're, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, you get paid once a month or every, every other week or whatever. It's pretty easy. If you could dedicate a couple bucks out of every paycheck to get started, it's not something you have to go buy all at once, like a fly rod, right? Like, you know, I don't, well, as far as I know, Sage doesn't do layaway for fly rods, <laughs> right. but, but it, it's pretty easy to be able to start with fly tying to where you can say, okay, I've got, you know, 50 bucks, 20 bucks each, you know, paycheck that I could set aside on fly tying and, and just gradually be able to stock up. Um, the well, biggest thing for, oh, there's ahead. like two main thoughts on this, right? Is, is, Hey, I'm going to kind of tiptoe into it and buy the materials to buy one or two flies as I go, assuming you've bought a vice and a handful of tools. Or the other theory is like, I don't know what I want to tie. I need to buy all of the standard materials, you know, the ones that you use in a ton of different flies. And then from there, I can go into the, the, you know, kitchen cupboard and grab the materials I need. sounds kind of like that's what you're talking about. A little bit. Yeah. I like the first method that you said. I don't like the second method of just buying a bunch of different blanket materials. Um, the, the number, I don't like any kit. There is not a fly tying kit on the market from any company period that materials I think is wise? worth the money. No, the, the, like the boxes of, well, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of my problems are the materials that come with them, but like the starter kits, the starter boxes has like a vice and some tools and some materials. There's not one of those that I would recommend to anybody. I think they're all pretty garbage. The ones that include the vice. Cause there's mm-hmm. tool kits, right? I've heard you talk well now, about tool kits. Yes, the best toolkit on the market is loons. Okay, it, it's not super expensive. I mean, they're they're great tools. They're like great budget tools. It's, you're, it's not like something that you know you're never going to be able to use, or you know something you got to grow into or whatever. They're just a high quality toolkit. Um, if you're just looking for like a toolkit, highly recommend the loon one. I think Doctor Slick also makes something like that. Those are fine. Stay away from anything that has materials in it. The material kits are, yeah. that I've ever dealt with are garbage. The materials that come in those kits, number one, 
are, I don't, they're not very quality materials and they're not going to be things that you really are going to need. Um, so I would highly recommend you stay away from that. One of the biggest problems with those materials and in getting started in general is the vice. So those like you, you've got a lot of different price points for vices because I've got, you know, I've got two top of the line vices that are more expensive than some fly rods. But then you also have vices that start at like 20 bucks. Yep. Um, I don't want to say you can't tie a fly on the one that costs $20. Um, but just like everything, it, it it's not going to work. And, and seriously, I used to teach a lot of fly tying classes. People that try to use that $20 vice get extremely frustrated in trying to learn. Because it, because not only are you trying to learn how to actually, you know, tie and wrap the feathers and do all the different things, you're trying to learn all these, all these techniques, but yet your hook is not in the right location. It's not getting held right. You're fiddling with the vice. You're trying to make the vice actually hold the hook. It's a, it's a, it's a whole problem. So, yeah. So the, let's, let's elaborate on the vice thing. Cause I think that's going to be the first question from everyone. That's the number one. That's, yep. So. Start it, my my point of view, starting from the twenty dollar vice, you've got every single price point imaginable, all the way up to what is five, six, eight hundred dollars, probably more. No, that's a no. Yeah, you're looking closer to like twelve hundred dollars these days. Yeah, but in my opinion, as you do move up the price scale, I'm sure there's nuance to like, well, this two hundred fifty dollar vice is better than this three hundred fifty dollar vice, whatever it is. But as you move up you generally get little features that make tying either slightly more efficient, slightly more comfortable, or yep. it's less friction to tie a fly. Right. You're fighting the tool less than yes. you would be. Do you, do you have a sweet spot, do you think? I mean, we all want the Rolex hanging off our fly tying table. <laughs> but the, the, the sweet spot for me is like 100-ish bucks. Okay get out of the, like, get out of the 20 to $50 range uh, immediately. I, if if you guys are actually interested in starting fly tying, I would not even fool with those. Go ahead and head up to like the 50 to a hundred dollar range. The best vice for beginners. Actually, I realize the price has gone up due to you know, whatever inflation stuff. that's happening these days. Um, I used to sell it for 160 bucks. And I think it's now 180. It's a the Renzetti Traveler. It's the it's a full rotary, full function vice. Holds every hook from dry fly all the way up to saltwater stuff. To me, it's the best number one vice. If you're going to have one vice, that's it. And that's essentially the big difference. That's like the big thing swapping from like a hundred dollar vice or maybe like an eighty dollar vice to like a a eighty plus dollar vice is going to be whether it's rotary or not. Um, for me, actually tying, I can tie on a vice that's not true rotary or that's not, you know, where it doesn't spin. Um, my flies actually, even though I would consider myself a pretty good fly tire, my flies actually do look worse off of a vice that does not spin because I can't see what the other side of the fly looks like. Like I'm, I'm, if you can imagine like you're, you're doing something on this side, but like, you know, who knows what the other side of the fly is looking like. So mm -hmm. I may be, I may be even tied like a basic woolly booger and I'm wrapping it and I'm like, Oh yeah, that looks great. I flip it over and some of my hackles are, you know, my wraps are wrong. I'm like, what the heck? Like, so anyways, I don't like a non rotary vice. I would highly recommend you guys look at a rotary. There's two other brands that I, that I personally don't have very much, um, uh, uh, experience with, but there's a Griffin, vice that is a that's a good price point um and there's also another vice called a mongoose um another good price point vice i think they may be more budget friendly than the renzetti yep. these days yep. but um i think I, I, any any of those are good options i really do think though you should be prepared to spend somewhere in the ballpark of about 150 bucks on a vice that's where i would start I I would not fool with the the smaller the you know the cheaper clamp vices. If you're if I would I would think to yourself seriously if you're going to get into it, this is actually something you want to do. 
then you should put in the 150 bucks to buy a real vice. I, if you are, if you're trying to ball as hard as you can on a budget and you want just a table vice and you, and you can't afford the $150 vice then I would not get into fly tying. I would just go buy the flies you need at the shop. Yeah, I would agree with that. We'll um, talk. We'll so, elaborate on that later. Yes, yes. <laughs> As we're getting we're getting myths. Yeah, we're gonna get back into that. Yeah. Um. So my number one on how to get into it, one hundred fifty dollars vice plus. Then go grab. Uh. Well, one more point on that one too. That basic the or not the basic the the Renzetti that I mentioned the one that's like you know one hundred and eighty bucks now. That vice, it, the cool thing with vices is that once you get to a point on that vice, I don't necessarily think you have to buy a nicer one. Literally past that, it's it's not like fly rods that like, yeah, I mean, that $1,000 fly rod is going to be a lot better. Maybe not double, but close to double the performance of a $500 fly rod. Vices, I don't think are that way. Yeah. I could tie just as good of a fly off a $200 vice as a $1,200 vice. So... Mm-hmm. Once you get to that level, like it's like a light switch. Once you hit that level, I think you're set. It's not something that personally, if you want to upgrade that, literally you're just going to buy a Rolex instead of a you know a watch. Like that's or that's something that's just nicer. Yeah, or maybe they have a, a few other features you can buy that, like a a material clip that works better than the little hairband with a spring on it type stuff. Right. Yeah. So. You know, there are small reasons, but the, the law of diminishing returns. Yeah, it, applies. It, it hits quick on vices, personally. Mm-hmm. Um, so, vice, grab a toolkit. I like the Loon one. We already mentioned that. Just the basic toolkit from them. Um, and we're going to go over more, kind of a little more in depth here in a minute. And then, go ahead and think of like three or four flies that you like to fish. Um, that's pretty, I mean, any fly fisherman should be able to say that. Okay. You live in Colorado. These are, here's three or two to four of my favorite flies. You know, maybe you even live in Alabama. Okay. Here's two to four of my favorite flies. Should be pretty easy for most of you guys out there to pick two to four flies and then go buy the specific things you need to tie those two to four flies. How do you Um, find those specific things? So either Google you know, a materials list, how to tie blank fly. It's going to tell you, you know, a a recipe essentially for how to tie it. Um, And if you're picking, say you're picking two, two nymphs and maybe two dry flies. The good thing with, once you start buying these color, these uh, materials, they're going to overlap so much. So say a lot of the, the materials that you're going to use to tie nymphs are all going to be the same. They may change colors or whatever a little bit, but the basic recipe for most nymphs is going to be, you know, pretty similar. Like, say, pheasant tail. You're going to use pheasant tail on a lot of different nymphs. Some sort of nymph dubbing. You're going to use that in a lot of different nymphs. So it makes it really easy to be able to, if you just start out purchasing the specific things to tie one to two flies, you're going to really start expanding how much stuff you have quickly. If you say like fishing nymphs um, and ev- very quickly, you'll get to the point where you're like, oh, I want to tie this new nymph. Oh, OK. I need one new material to tie this nymph because I already have everything else from the other nymphs that I've been tying. Yeah. How one, one thing that I and I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm not fully down this rabbit hole, but one thing that I realized was. You can certainly make material substitutions. I mean, if a recipe yep. calls for a certain super fine dubbing that's, you know, niche color, you could make do with a, not, a normal dubbing that's not a super fine material. But, yeah. you know, I, on the other hand of that, I appreciate the fly tires that are really, really picky and have a very specific use case for it. And maybe that like super fine does catch more fish than the normal dubbing on their local fishery. I but, think that's the big thing is to know, you know, how, maybe that that fly is probably the best that it can be for the guy that designed it. But where is he fishing? Like mm-hmm. if he's fishing on the East Coast, I mean, that still may be a great pattern on the West Coast. But the, color wise, I mean, you know, I would I would just say fish that in whatever color you want to fish it. In. Yeah. 
Yeah, but the the whole point of saying that is take your materials list with a grain of salt if you're not really trying to squeeze everything you can out of it. I mean, yeah. you might get to the point where you're tying flies because you're only catching, you know, 10 fish and you want to catch 20 fish. I think that's not a good reason. But anyway, like if if you're really trying to get narrow on it, then you got to geek out on the on the exact materials, but you're just getting into it. You can you can make substitutions and still have an effective fly. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, but just getting going, that's what I would do. Starting out, that's the best way to start. Hands down, pick a couple flies, start start buying the actual materials you need. And then that way you could start buying, you know, in colors that you like. You really quickly will will gain, you know, uh, a, a, a group of materials that you will be able to use in a lot of different patterns. Um, there's yep. a lot of overlap. So, um, yeah, you'll you'll get that really quick. And then in doing that, you'll start having, you know, the colors that you like to tie in. And it's pretty soon you might – it really shouldn't take you very long before you say, oh, there's a new fly. I want to try tying that. You pull up a materials list and it, it you already have every material to tie it. Like that doesn't right. happen. That's that'll happen pretty quick with that method. Yep. Okay. So so far we have how to start. Our three items are get yourself a vise, preferably a rotary vise. Um, you can make do with a pair of pliers if you really want to, but there's a big, big curve when you get to that rotary vise. Buy a toolkit, which has probably a bob and scissors, a handful of other things. But if yep. you had to narrow it down, it would be vice, bob and scissors, and then a handful of materials. Yes. Okay. So that's our, yep. our baseline three. Vice, <laughs> vice, bob and scissors, and then pick your materials list, grab those materials, start running with it. Yep. That's how I would do it. <laughs> and what about, so we talked about the quality of, vices and how you know the price point from 25 to 150 makes a really big difference on on how nice your vice is uh what about bobbin and scissors is there nuance to that or do you just buy the cheapest one i don't personally fish the cheap or use the cheapest one but i actually don't use the more expensive ones either mine okay. are i think each one of my bobbins they're 15 to 20 dollars a piece and are those the, pre, do they have the ceramic insert yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I do like the ceramic tubes. Um, actually, I think can you explain a little difference to, to those that might not know what the ceramic thing is? Yeah. So, uh, if you're too, if you're very, very beginner, a bobbin is what holds your thread or how you wrap your thread. So literally the two material, the two tools that you have to have, no matter what you're tying would be a vice and the number two would be bobbin. That's what you're going to hold to actually wrap everything with. So, uh, bobbins go everywhere from super cheap to very expensive. Um, I like the ones where I control the tension. So there's multi, there's some that have like different tensioning systems or whatever. I don't like those. I think they're okay. I wouldn't judge you if you used one, but I've tried essentially every one of them on the market and I don't like it. Um, but certain bobbins will have just like a steel or a metal tube that the thread goes through. I don't like those because the I feel like the me, the metal has pretty sharp edges, and as you're going to wrap, it makes your thread fray more. Versus uh, what Brent's talking about with like a ceramic tube, is the tube that comes down is made of a ceramic that's super slick, and it and it's it'll have like a rounded beveled edge. So as you go to wrap, your thread is like going through the tube a little s slicker. Um, I do like those. That's a good upgrade. The biggest upgrade on the bobbins that I like, they have these uh, Teflon coated pieces where the uh, uh, where the That's thread cool. hooks in instead of being metal. Um, I actually, so if you're listening to us, I'm showing a picture of, a, uh, or I'm showing my bobbin here. But see this this white piece here is like a Teflon, like a super slick plastic. I actually really like that because it lets the thread spin easier. I also do really like the loon ones as well. They they fit good in my hand. I like the, I mean, I like how they're laid out. 
they're pretty ergonomic. So I, I use the loon ones quite a bit as well. Yep. I think the, the biggest reason for having the, the slick part that uh, clips onto the spool would be if you're tying nymphs with a thinner, weaker thread, you're not going to yep. pop the thread and, and break it by pulling too hard as often. But if you're just yep. tying yep. saltwater stuff with streamers, probably less important because the thread is less. generally a bit stronger. Yep. 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 Sweet. So let's move on to tools that are nice to have that aren't necessarily mandatory. Are we doing that or are we doing our, our myths first? I think we should go, let's keep rolling on the tools. Let's keep it. So we've got a vice, a bobbin, and scissors are probably what you're going to use on every single fly. But on scissors, one of the things I found very quickly is that nice tying scissors are very nice to have because you can get in and cut really nice and tight. And if you have a nice expensive pair of scissors, you don't want to be making what I would just call rough cuts with those. Uh, you have things like cutting wire, cutting thick hair, cutting like a rough cut that you're not going to, you know, it doesn't matter how nice and clean the cut is. So I would highly recommend having two pairs of scissors. One, maybe you spend a little bit of money on, or maybe it's one of those, you know, the pair of loon scissors that came out of your kit. Um, I don't even care if it's another nice pair of scissors. Run over to Walmart and get it like a cheap pair of like craft scissors or something. But don't make bad rough cuts and cut stuff like wire and tinsel and whatever. Don't use your nice pair of scissors for that. Um, so I highly recommend two pairs of scissors. One nice fly tying pair and then one cheap pair. But that cheap pair is going to keep your nice pair for much, much longer. It's going to keep that pair nice. Um, yeah, they so go really surprisingly like quick. When you're cutting they wire do. and rabbit fur and deer hair, oh. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff, I never use my nice pair of scissors. And I actually, I've even gone one further. I have three pairs of scissors that I use uh, at all times. And I kind of, boom, <laughs> flex on y'all. And I actually rotate those in and out. Uh, not in and out, but like, one, I kind of rotate them down. So like once my my like number one pair of scissors goes, goes out, it goes in, essentially it just goes in the, you know, everything slides up one yep. and I just keep moving those up. And of course, for how often I tie that unfortunately happens pretty often. So, um, but my number two that I use all, all like all the time that I can't really tell you the one number, it, the number one thing that I use it for is called a bodkin. Essentially it's just a needle. It's a very sharp piece of metal. Um, with a kind of a good grip on it. And I use that. I mean, I use it for all sorts of different things. Um, cleaning out the hook eye at the end of the fly, uh, picking dubbing. I technically that's what it is, is a dubbing pick where you can go in and pick dubbing out. Uh, I use it for dubbing loops. I use it for foam and to make poke holes in foam. If you need that. Uh, I mean, I, I use it for a little bit of everything. It's just such a nice tool to have. Yeah. Um, sharp, you use do you use the bodkin for uh, wiping UV or glue and, and massaging that? Yeah. Do you yeah. have two bodkins? Because I always got glue on the end of my bodkin, and I forgot to wipe it off, and then it just turned into a mess. I, I do have two bodkins, but actually I have two di bodkins for two different reasons. More past that, I still use my nice bodkin for moving glues around. Um, but I have learned if you take your cheap pair of scissors, you can actually cut the glue off that bodkin pretty easy. Uh, so that does happen to mine. My bodkin will have, get glue on it, and I'll just take my uh, or a box cutter, cheap pocket knife or whatever, and that glue, you can almost like whittle the glue off the metal easily. I keep a second bodkin for another reason, because I have a cheap bodkin that I leave on my desk with a lighter, and I'll light the tip of the bodkin and stick it through, like, uh, you can burn out material from the eye of a hook. Um, you you can do different things with, like, rubber legs if you, like, burn them. But you can't apply the heat from a lighter. You'll have to, like, burn the – you get the bodkin hot, and then when you touch it to it, the like, grasshopper legs, essentially. They'll kind of, like, bend in the right direction. 
uh, things like that. So I do have a bodkin that I'll burn and use to burn stuff with. Nice. Do you so, do you do that with foam and rabbit strips too? Does that help get holes in there? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's a pro move. Yeah. So, anyways, bodkin. Love a bodkin. They're they're cheap. I would have one. The number two is uh, not a ton of fly tying. Oh, sorry, three. Not a ton of fly tying kits will come with them, but a good pair of tweezers is great. And I don't even think you need fly tying tweezers. I, I don't know how much fly tying tweezers cost. I would go, I mean, you go to Walmart and buy a pair of, uh, you know, thing, I don't know, fingernail tweezers, something from the beauty, beauty aisle at Walmart or like CVS. I would just go, just buy go to your wife's tweezers. bathroom. You just Grab start stealing ice. Yeah. Steal a lot of stuff from my wife, actually, for fly time. <laughs> Fingernail polish, all sorts of stuff. Number four. All right, number four. I this is a this is actually a relatively new one for me over the past few years. Um, I was telling you about how I kind of transitioned my scissors from like bad to good, and then once the good ones, I kind of you know I'll move them to the not good ones, and then that, those will uh, the worst ones I'll throw away. But I'll tell you because those scissors do get so bad so quick. I keep a wire cutter around. So I have a, uh, I bought them off Amazon or you run over to like Lowe's or Home Depot. Buy a wire cutter. I like the ones that like have the spring loaded where you, you know, clip them. I use that now. I do not cut any sort of wire with my scissors anymore. Even my bad scissors, I found those would just ruin them so quick. Uh, you know, the non toxic wire wrap that you do for like adding weight. Uh, a lot of brushes nowadays will have wire in them. Um, I, and the wire cutters stay sharp for so long. I use them all the time for cutting, uh, you know, br- like any of the brushes, even if it's not like a metal core, even like the, the flashy brushes uh, mm. with like the, you know, the soft core that you just wrap. Any of that stuff I use a wire cutter for. So I started leaving a wire cutter around all the time. Sweet. Number five. I'm keeping track now. Number five would be a brush hair, like, uh, or a, br- a sorry, just a brush for uh, hair, like zonkers or whatever. But I'm uh, like, I've tail. never had that issue. Yeah, you do. Ha- you do have that issue if you, you know, if it doesn't grow in all patchy and redneck like. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Mine does. <laughs> but um, I, I have a little brush that I keep around that I'll use to uh, brush zonkers, brush the under fur out of deer hair, uh, brush like bucktail a lot. Sometimes if you, especially if you're using bucktail down on the lower end of it, it'll still have some fuzzy stuff. I like to have a brush to be able to brush that stuff out with. Is that more like a toothbrush or does it, is it one of those metal hard brushes? So I, I keep two, I could, I could do without the really bit, the fat, the fat brush. I like this one. But I could do without this brush. This is the brush that I really like. And you can see how fine those teeth are. You can't yeah, even really see through them. They're both metal teeth, though, correct? Do you metal think that teeth. I, I don't like the plastic teeth brushes because they break on me. Okay. Like, way too quick. You're just too aggressive. Maybe I'm too aggressive with it. I also tie a lot of flies. But maybe that's it. But I like the metal teeth. I like the, the loon one's great for you know bigger stuff uh but i really like having a super fine tooth comb this is actually an eye an eyebrow comb that i order on like amazon for you know it's getting a little i don't weird, really know man. this is I getting a little why, weird dude it, it, look, <laughs> it is what it is i don't know I'm, I, I can't tell you why women have an eyebrow an eyebrow brush but they do and that's what this is for but i'll tell you what they they need to remarket themselves to fly tying because it's much better. <laughs> so I like that. Um, a dubbing pick or a or a dubbing brush. You'll see, or, or some people will have like a kind of a sticky uh, brush. Like Loon Loon has one that'll look like this, where it's got like a lot of little spiky fibers off the sides of it for almost, picking dubbing. That's like the. Man, the thing you use to clean out threads if you're a car mechanic. It's a pretty stout brush. You know, that's the only other place I've seen something like that. That's exactly right. Um, I like those. Those are okay. Um, don't, like that Loon one is probably my favorite one that they make on the market. But I made a tool that 
I think is better better than all of it. It is a popsicle stick that I have glued a piece of Velcro to right here. It's kind of white with the light, so it's hard to see. But okay. I glued a piece of Velcro right here on this popsicle stick. This is my dubbing brush, and I like it. I like it better than the ones that you buy online. So was that I, would, was that initially like a rocket pop or more of an ice cream uh, based? It was one of the magnums. <laughs> <laughs> so ice cream based popsicle stick. You don't want to go yeah, with just a sugary rocket pop. Yeah, style. I don't. Yeah, I would recommend the ice cream one. Don't do the uh, like the bomb pop because then your popsicle stick's going to be like blue or red or whatever. Okay. I don't. I don't mess with that. Yeah, it's distracting to have the red stain. Too distracting. It is. Yeah. It is. So yeah, go with an ice cream based pro tip. <laughs> ice cream based popsicle for your for your stick. But anyways, I like the Velcro. Works really great. I just needed something to put the Velcro on so popsicle stick work. On the other side I glued a magnet, which is really great. So you like can an pick actual up magnet. Yeah, it's a magnet. You can pick up beads with it. So like if I'm doing nymphs and I've got some really small, you know, those tiny little beads and my massive sausage fingers can't can't work with them. So uh, you can stick the magnet down. You're telling me you use up. a magnet and then tweezers just to get this stupid little bead on a hook. Like you got to make a tool. Yeah. Buy, okay. Just checking. That's I, you know. That's what I do. Okay. Yep. That's why I don't tie nymphs. That's pro level. But magnet Velcro, I like that. Um, one of the next things, if this is and now from here, it's kind of going to start getting. A little, a little much, but I've got a couple more tools that I wanted to mention that, that I use pretty often is a dubbing spinner. So if you're going to make your own brushes, that's a big thing nowadays. You're going to make, uh, you're going to put, you know, make some bigger dubbing ropes, something that's a little bulkier, um, probably more so for, you know, streamers. And if you tie a lot of streamers, this probably be something that you would need a lot more than if you tied dries. But I really like dubbing spinners. Um, the loon one makes my favorite. It's a hook. It's kind of weighted. You put the loop through it and then you spin it. And when you spin it, it just creates that dubbing rope. And, uh, it's makes it super simple to be able to create like a body or something like that. Um, those of you listening, this is a hard one to, to picture, but basically it's just like a weighted piece of metal with a hook coming off off of it and you can spin it and it holds the momentum but uh maybe you should just go watch the youtube version and you'll get to see it well actually i'll tell you there may or may not be a really good video of that episode seven of the blue line tying toolbox oh well plug that right so right here it's around right here uh yeah so episode seven of the tying toolbox is all about dubbing and we show you how to create a dubbing loop. Um, but I was going to ask you with the dubbing, the dubbing brush versus loop. Do you have you ever built a dubbing loop brush? Do you know Do you know anything about that? I've tried a couple times. Uh, I'm super impatient, and those brushes are cool, and they come in a ton of colors and all the different sizes now. So uh, lazy me, you can't just I just buy them. Yeah, I did just buy the brushes. But you could make, you know, your multi-custom color. I, I can see it. I like making my own, but, you know, people have talked to me about, like, buy, you know, have you seen the jig table that you buy that makes, like, where you can build your brush on a table and then it, you actually make your own brush? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of that. I've tried a couple custom brushes like that. I, I like just making it per as I go fly by fly. The dubbing, you know, it takes a lot of time. You know, you got to lay all the stuff out exact, and then you got to lay the thing, and do the, you know, the wraps, and then spin it. And, and you got to have that big tool. Yeah, and then you got to have the whole jig somewhere. For me, I just make the brush on the fly as I tie it. So, you know, if I'm doing craft fur, some bucktail, or some flash, whatever, I'll just lay all of it out. And then that way I'm not laying out, you know, a bunch on a jig. I'm laying out, you know, just a little bit, just one cut, put it on one cut, put it in and then spin it and I'm done. So I feel like I can do it quicker. Just making it, you know, fly by fly. Um, 
This next one's pretty self-explanatory, but I like it for a couple different reasons. A hair stacker. I've got, I really like these. Um, if you tie a lot of dries, you probably need a hair stacker. That helps to even up all the tips. So for like an elk hair caddis where you do the wing or like a stimulator, it makes the tips all level. If they're not level, it's going to look a little ragged at the end of it. Honest to God, it's probably going to fish the exact same. But I do like the way that a nice, you know, clean hair stack looks. Yeah. But I've got a couple. I actually have a couple sizes of them. And there's obviously a few different tools that you could do to do this. But, like, this is the inside of one of my hair stackers. So you'd slide the material down this. But I mm-hmm. actually use this thing for my larger streamers to, like, push backwards. Like a straw. Over the eye whatever. of the hook over the eye of the hook to help push material back. And I like these because they're metal. So it's a metal cylinder. I don't even use this size. I bought this I bought this dubbing or this hair stacker because I like the really small size that I could push backwards onto a onto a fly. Okay. Um one that I put on the nice to have stack is a wit finish tool. I I personally still use a whip finish tool. I learned to tie with one. I think that I can do it quicker with a – maybe not quicker. I can get a tighter wrap with a whip finish tool than I can trying to do the hand tie. Um, and especially for me, the hand tying – I can hand tie, but it's very hard to do if you have a big spun deer hair head mm-hmm. where there's fibers hanging out over the hook eye. And you're trying to, I don't know, I have a hard time with that, but I I can do a whip finisher a whole lot better um, on those brush heads or a big deer hair, deer hair head if I have a whip finish tool. Um, so certainly not like a must have. You can do it by hand if you're trying to save the money, but I do like having a whip finish tool. I'm surprised you don't have that higher on the list. I mean, for all those big nymphers out there. It seems like you can be a, big, a lot more precise tying your whip finish with the tool. <coughs> you probably could, but I think behind a bead head, if you're tying behind a bead head, I don't. I'll, All right. If Save I was tying money. behind a bead head, I might even I might not even use the whip finish tool. I've never learned how to use one. I couldn't figure it out, well, but for some reason, I could figure it out with the hands. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I think that's why I put it so far down the list. It's like, it's very nice to have if you, if you want to learn how to do it, but on the other hand, uh, you know, do it either learning, learning to actually whip finish by hand, or if you just do like two half hitches around Mm -hmm. it and then put a dot of cement, you know, is this a hot topic in fly tying? Like, are there people that are, you know, all aboard, you got to have a whip finisher. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been in fist fights over it for sure. Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I met mean, this I'm, guy. So yeah, just don't um, walk into a shop and take a stance. No. <laughs> I think, I think, I don't think it's that big of like a, oh, you got to do it this way. I, but I do think there's more and more guys nowadays that I've heard that are like, oh, you don't need a whip finish tool. Just use your hands. There's no got reason it. to have a tool. It's, it's difficult to use. You bought a tool for no good reason. But yet again, if you go buy the, you know, one of the toolkits is probably going to come with a whip finish tool. Yep. Um, I like it. I use them pretty much every fly that I finish uses a whip finish tool. So, um, my last one, this one's kind of just out there, but if you're tying, there's a cut, there's a couple certain flies that if you're going to tie them, I feel like this is like a non-negotiable tool that you have to have is a leg puller. You ever use one of those? No. Uh, most of the dry flies that you use, you probably tie the legs in like on either side and make them, you know, whatever. But there's a, there's like a couple poppers or like a really good example. There's a couple, maybe grasshopper patterns where you, where you actually have to put the legs through foam and the, and you, it's like, you cannot do it correctly without a leg puller. Um, okay. take your bodkin, your nice needle, you poke it through. And then you take this tool, stick it through. It's got a little hook on it. You hook the legs in, and then it's got a little flap that comes down, and you pull the legs through. 
I, I like them. If you're going to tie something like a popper or like a grasshopper that uses it, there's not a substitute. Um, but it is a little hook. It's like a tiny little hook. And uh, there's a couple different things that I like using it for that, other than just a leg puller. So, okay. Nice to have just like a little, tiny little hook. It's a, useful, it's a useful little thing. Well, there's so, your top 10 list. There that was is. a top 10. The top 10s of what to have, wow. why to have them, what you need to start with. But I think we should get on to our Instagram submissions as the yes. last thing here. We're getting on closer to an hour, so I think we should start wrapping up. Cool. This, this right. is our last topic. Let's get them rocking. I got the list of responses, and we're going to grill Adam with these myths because I don't tie enough to have too hard of a stance on all of them. So we're going to wear, out, wear Adam out here. Uh, we actually did cover the first one already, and I took a stance on it, so now here I am. Uh, <laughs> the one response was, what is a myth? in fly fishing was a question. One response was that you always need the exact materials for a recipe. You don't. If you're not generally speaking, no. Same thing like cooking. Yeah. Yeah. You You add a few extra chocolate chips. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, here or there you substitute, you know, this spice for this spice. Who cares? Yeah. Cover it up. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Whatever. Next on the list. Why has tying flies that catch fishermen become more popular than tying quality flies it's money you think i think it is okay there are flies i'd love to hear your hot take on it my hot take is that if you like fly tying you're looking for another hobby and as we go down the hobby path we want to get better at that hobby i mean if you were tying flies as a means to an end as in saving money and and or catching fish you wouldn't end up caring i don't think you'd end up caring that much about you know the the ties that look super realistic super pretty so that's my hot take right there and i think that's good for you if you want to tie flies that are a work of art it's awesome to see yeah they're cool bad catching don't, them I mean, in don't get me wrong yep <laughs> i i think I think it's a money thing because there are flies that just, I, I mean, so when I worked at a fly shop, right, I was in charge of ordering in flies and, you know, having them in the bins and whatever. There were flies that I knew worked it want some of the best flies that you could buy, right. Or whatever for the, for the area that we were in, there was specifically, there was this one nymph that I, it was, it, it, I used to guide the river. It was like a trout nymph thing. It was like the number one nymph for me. Like I could go do a whole day's guided trip and only bring this like one fly. That was it. But man, I could not sell it at the store. People would be like, oh, what flies do I buy? They'd be like, oh, this this, this is like the best one. And they'd be like, mm, what else you got? You could show them something that looked way better and they would buy it. I mean, this thing looked, the that nymph looked horrible. Like, it did not look like something that you, like, it doesn't look like a pheasant tail and all perfect, like a copper john. It, you know, whatever. It looked stupid. But I couldn't convince people to buy it, even though it was my number one choice for fishing there. So, I personally think it's a it's a money thing. Because if you go into a fly shop, and you, if you can't sell the fly, then why, why would the company produce it? Sure. Um, we had a fly like that at Blue Line. One of our first flies that we came out with was part of our Gen 1 thing. One of my favorite flies that, that we had, because we don't carry it anymore, because we couldn't sell it. It was called the Bronze Stout. It was a pretty simple articulated streamer. Um, it was at a great price point. People didn't buy it. Um, I don't know why. Fish. But it was one of the best flies that we sold. I mean, period. <laughs> but people didn't buy it. So we, I mean, I couldn't, I, I mean, as a business wise, I can't continue buying or, you know, carrying flies that people aren't, aren't buying. So I think it's a money thing is what it, that's come to. But on the flip side, I think you could say, you know, I think a lot, a, a lot of our flies do sell and I don't sell a fly that doesn't catch fish in my opinion. I mean, yep. uh, all the flies that we sell are not for fishermen. They're for fish, but 
you do have to as a as a professional tire business you know owner i do have to take into account will this sell i can't yeah. just make a fly that's great for fishing if i can't sell it well so. a prerequisite to a fly that will catch fish is that it has to catch the fishermen first for them to tie it on so that's true there you are all right yep. next it's question a, it, it's it's a balancing game for sure on that totally totally the next question, remember the question was, what are fly tying myths you want us to talk about? And this person brought up a myth that says, that he says, the myth is biot bodies are good. And he puts a little asterisk there that says, because they aren't. What's a biot body? I think I know, but. I'm trying to think of a specific fly that utilizes a biot body that you would know. It, there, it, is it a goose biot? Is, uh, probably the most popular, the most famous use for a, a biot is uh, the tail of a copper john is what they call biot. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a primary flight feather from a goose. Real stiff, kind of triangular piece, and it's just the one little fiber from a goose's feather. And uh, you tie it in, you wrap it. Um, it's, it's actually gotten big in the Euro nymph scene. Well, there you go. Let me just keep moving on from that. Yep. <laughs> um, they I, they make kind of a cool uh, look that's hard to get because they're kind of a different shade of color throughout the triangle. Will be you yeah, know, yeah. And so when you wrap it, you get this kind of interesting shape. And I, yeah, personally, I don't know. I don't. I don't use a lot of buyout bodies. I don't think they uh, they don't have a lot of spot for me. But the nymph. Nymp stuff works well with them you know it would it would sink really well it's not going to have a lot of fight it's not fibrous really at all um i don't know okay well next question i don't know why they're, I don't know why they're so popular unreal but euro nippers um, did it so we can we yeah. can blame them for that we got an idea all right adding sticker eyes to your streamer doesn't matter it only looks better to the angler where are you at Oh, you know what? I'm a little 50-50. There's a couple reasons here. Adam from Blue Line, if you take a look at our flies, we do not have very many stick-on eyes for a couple reasons. One, probably the biggest reason, is because they they come off. There is so no fast. good way so fast. There is no really, really good way to have a sticker eye on, like, dubbing or deer hair or whatever. Um, as long as you're not throwing your flies and trees a whole lot, those those sticker eyes to me can only stand up to a few toothy fish, a big couple big browns, and that fly is gonna and those eyes are gonna be gone anyways. So then I never wanted to get into the whole thing of like, oh, hey Adam, you know these eyes fell off this fly. Can you you know send me a new one? Yeah. When in reality you don't need it. Like look at our cooter brown. Uh, the first. You know, you can certainly do stick on eyes on a on you know a deer hair head, but they're going to come off after a few fish, anyways. Now, all the ones that I purchase from like from you know the shops, they all fall apart. So yeah. it just yeah. wasn't something that I wanted to mess with. However, I will say that I do think there could be a, a benefit in the fact that if you use the flashy ones, I think the flashy ones might you know could potentially trigger like a little bit of a different response. Like you have that little, you know, that bit like a, the silver flash or whatever mm -hmm. one. I think that maybe could. And I know there's certainly different, different predatory fish will eat head first or tail first. Yep. And I do wonder if they don't like key in on an eye. Aim for the like, eyes. Yeah, like you kind of know, like if they can see a midge, they can see a freaking bait fish's eye. You bet. Um, but if you've got the right shape and profile and everything, I mean, I've probably I've caught more smallmouth bass on that cooter brown fly than probably anything else, and it doesn't have eyes. Um, yeah, and I I would I did I have tested it with eyes, and I don't think it matters. Yeah, I would so, argue I, that it probably makes a difference for bait fish patterns in the ocean more than for trout or smallmouth mm. or bass. Have you that ever could used be those game changer eyes? It's like a dumbbell eye, but plastic. I do like those. So that's one way to get your 
eyes to stick without adding weight is basically a dumbbell eye that's made out of plastic and doesn't weigh anything. Okay. Yeah. I prefer that over stick on. Yep. Done. Uh, we got, so, I don't know, some weird guy responded that he heard there's some sketchy ladders in Idaho. And uh, that's not a myth. Yeah, that's busted. That's busted. That's not that's a myth. proven. I think there are some sketchy ladders. In let's Idaho. just put that right here and we can relive it whether you've seen it yet or not. Oh shit. Oh. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh shit. Oh Good. Yep. <laughs> oh. We should have. Mm. I did not. I didn't know if you were hamming it up for the camera or. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> oh. We should check that camera gear real quick. <laughs> All right, uh, next myth. You need head cement slash glue for the fly to stay together. Nope. I don't use head cement or glue on a lot of my flies. If you know how to whip finish and you can actually do a good whip finish, you don't need it. Um, I don't add glues to hardly any flies that I tie myself. If I am going to sell a fly, I do... I will go the extra step and put a little dot of glue or UV cure. I like UV cure more than glue these days. Um, but definitely, if it, I think if you're trying to make your flies bomb proof, if you're tying bigger streamers that you don't really lose a lot, if you're doing what, you know, it, if you're selling them, I think, yeah, it makes more sense to have something on there. I, the, the number one thing I would say is try it. If your flies fall apart, well, maybe you need to learn how to whip finish or, Put some head cement on it. If they don't fall apart, then don't use it. Or um, quit casting them into the rocks so much, which is my problem, which is why I always glued my flies. There you go. So here's here's kind of kind of an interesting one on that same line. Um, do you think that glue affects the like? Can fish smell? And if yes, what do you think of glue on flies? Well, I think fish can smell. I don't know how much it matters because. So, I mean, if you got a bait fish that smells, I mean, you know, to us it kind of just smells like crap. Or you have a fly with a bunch of UV cure and super glue on it. If this bait fish smells like super glue and this one doesn't, which one do you think is going to get eaten more? I totally agree. But then you could argue that the dye in the color of your dubbing is probably going off there as well. And then this probably brings can. up, yeah. And then it brings up the uh, like the conservation side of things is like, are we putting toxic glue into the river? I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because we might run out of flies to fish. But I think there's probably something there. So anyway, I will say I don't. I don't. My last take on it. I don't know. I I'll. I don't think it matters for really predatory fish. I like I said. I don't use a lot of glue anyways. And I've caught plenty of fish on like big UV glue heads. So who knows? But I will not use glue on carp flies. Carp are one of the only fish that legitimately actually can smell, like really smell like you or I could smell. I do not use glue on carp flies, period. I don't know if that's just me or whatever. And even I got, I've nerded out on carp at a time in my life, I would even go as far as to soak my flies in like dirty, nasty water that was left outside to, so that it would smell like, uh, like moss the, or, yeah. or algae and stuff before I fished them. So, Do you think that's any different than soaking them in lunker lotion? No, lunker lotion's better, but if you're going the natural, the holistic route, yeah, that's a soaking them, you're soaking them in a with a line there in a nasty algae pool outside in an old dog bowl, primo. And <laughs> I will not use glue on bonefish and permit flies. I have no idea why, but it makes me feel better. Okay. I just feel better about myself that there's not you glue feel on them. I think that's it. It's a confidence thing. Yep, confidence flies are real, and not having glue on bonefish. 
or permit flies makes me feel better because if there, I don't want, I mean, permit are just so stupid. I, I don't even want one reason for them to not eat the fly. And I, if, if it's super glue, it's super glue, right? Like I don't, yep. I don't need one extra reason for them to not eat it. No kidding. There hey. you go. Yep. Can you resharpen tying scissors? No. Have you tried? Um, I've tried. <laughs> so most fly tying scissors have a micro serrated. One edge would be micro serrated. So you've got one edge that's got a bunch of tiny, tiny little bumps on it. And that helps grab the hair. So like if you're coming, you know, they're pinching this way, you're, they're going to grab some deer hair or whatever. They'll kind of help grab it with one edge. So that micro serrated edge, you really can't sharpen that. It'd be like trying to sharpen the serrated part of a you know, pocket knife. Like it doesn't bread really knife. work. Or a bread knife even, whatever. The other side might be a straight razor edge. I have tried putting those on a like my knife my pocket knife sharpening. You know, I've got a wet stone that you know I'll kind of oil up or whatever, and it has the different like sides based on you know how, what grit it is i have tried doing a really fine grit on that uh on some of my tying scissors and i swear it makes them better than they were but i feel like they they'll they'll get dull super quick again um and it's not worth the time and effort and headache in my opinion like they were just as they yes it made them better but then they were back to being just as bad in like the next two or three days. So to me, it wasn't worth it. Once they get to that point, I hate to say it. I normally toss them. Yep. Okay. So if you're good at sharp moving them things, down the rotation from, you know, nice to shit scissors. <laughs> yep. If you're good at sharpening things, it's metal. It'll work. But those micro serrations would be pretty hard to do. All right. Last one. It is not a so much of a myth, but more or less a question. And I think it is a, is a good wrap up. Um, what, is there a way to buy materials online that are ideally bought in a shop? Prime example would be deer hair or bucktail. Okay. No. Uh, those of you that don't know, it, there are much different qualities of deer hair and bucktail and, and how they spin and, or like fold and, and splay up. You, it varies a ton, uh, quality wise on those bucktails or deer hair. So here's a couple takes from me on that. If you go, so even when I lived in North Alabama and there's no fly shop near me, if I go in a fly shop, I don't care if I have 400 bucktails at home or big pieces of deer hair or whatever. If I go in a fly shop, I will look at their bucktail and their deer hair and I will buy every single one of them that is good. Now, I've walked out of fly shops before like, oh, crap, they had a lot of good ones today. <laughs> and I way overspent. Um, they don't go bad. It's not it's, As long as you take care of the material, it doesn't go bad. Um, if I see good material like that, I, I just buy it. It's not a question. Oh, do I need more white bucktail right now? The answer is going to be in the future, yes. I'm going to need more white bucktail, right? Or there's a couple of color bucktails I always use, like olives orange, you know, whatever. Anyways, if I go in a fly shop and I see that material, I buy it. Okay. As far as purchasing online, if you like, say you never go in a fly shop, like ever, that's not going to work. Um, you can go online and order it and you're just taking a risk that it's going to be crap. I have unfortunately had that happen quite a few times where I was like, man, I really need some white deer hair. I ordered some, it came in and I, it was like no good. And I just threw it in the garbage can. Um, that happens. That's a risk you're just going to take. The other thing that I would highly recommend to do though, with fly tying materials is it, even if, if you live somewhere that you do not have a fly shop that you can walk into and purchase the materials at, call a fly shop. If you could at least call, you know, maybe the next city over the next state over, maybe there's a fly shop that you go to on vacation. Maybe you live in Mississippi and every and you go to Montana to fly fish some. Call a shop that you've been to that you like, that you know has, has a decent tying section, 
those guys, I mean, probably don't call them on like a Saturday and ask them to go look through every bucktail on the wall. But if you call them on like a Monday afternoon, I don't know, whatever. More than likely, those guys, there's someone in that fly shop who knows fly tying materials who will go look through that stuff for you. So at minimum, you've at least got someone's eyes on it to say, hey, this is actually a good piece of deer hair. We'll mail you this one. Um, that is what I started doing. There's a play, there is a shop that I order a lot of my bucktails from that I just call them and say, Hey, I want like five. And they, you know, they kind of do custom bucktails and, and that's where I get those from. But, uh, yeah, so those are my, those are my two ideas is if, if that's a material that you know, you use when you go in a fly shop, if you see it, buy it. Cool. Or call, Easy as that. call your local fly shop and at least get another set of eyes on it. Awesome. That's what I do. Well, that's a, well, that's a lot. That was a lot about you, fly tying. That was, that was actually an hour of fly tying right there. I didn't think we could do it. We could have tied a lot of flies. Oh, the number one, the number one, the number one myth we didn't answer. We'll answer it right here at the very end. Do you save money buying or tying? I think it's cheaper to buy. Unless to buy. you f- exclusively fish streamers and lose a lot of them. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm still going. It's cheaper to buy flies. Yeah. If you want to buy time wise, time, money, I, all of it. If you were really, really, really dedicated to fishing a zebra midge, that was the only thing you ever fished. You bought the cheapest vice in the world and you never bought anything more than zebra midge materials. You could probably get away tying zebra midges for cheaper. Other than that, you will not save money tying flies. It is but much. But you will have a sweet arts and crafts room. You will have a nice, a much nicer arts and crafts room that your wife can yell at you about. <laughs> so there's a pro. <laughs> so you got that going for you. <laughs> well, awesome. On that, on that note, guys, if you enjoyed this podcast, please let us know. Do some comments, whatever. Another. Also, we do have the Blue Line uh, fly tying tutorial coming that is currently still rolling out. We've been posting one a week. We're on episode like 14 right now. The fly tying or the tying toolbox is the name of it. If you Google that, search it up, head over to the Blue Line YouTube page. Um, We have a lot of really cool uh, fly tying demonstrations. Brent actually filmed that and and helped me out with, you know, kind of organizing it all out and how to do it. Um, and then I kind of ran through it. It's not how it's how to tie flies. It's not, here's how you tie one specific pattern. It's like, here's how you actually put all of these skills together to tie flies. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about fly tying, head over there and check that out. Shameless, shameless YouTube blue line plug right there. Run it, run it. All right. Um, Those of you that are still here, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and Share this with your friends if you think it's interesting. If not, come back and watch the next one or listen to it on Apple, Spotify, Google, all the things. Yep. And if you were listening, I did show a couple of uh, clips here, some of the tools and things we talked about. So uh, if you did listen and you want to see what we talked about, hop over to the YouTube. Happy time. We'll see you all later.